Hello and welcome to the third video in the Snakemake 101 tutorial series. In this video we're going to be discussing adding threads and parallelism and we'll also be discussing the wildcards and how to use them in a Snakemake workflow. To begin, let's go over threads. They can be simply specified by using this threads keyword. And unlike other keywords, you don't actually have to put double quotes around this one. And so it could just be an integer. Now, what this does doesn't magically parallelize anything in SnakeMeg, but it does set the number of threads that you would like to use for the rule. And so if we save this, and of course delete our files so they're not created, and run SnakeMake, we can ignore that for a moment. By default, if you run SnakeMake without the cores argument, it'll assume one. And so here it says right at the top that we've provided only one core because we haven't specified otherwise. And it's going to run this with only one core. To better illustrate that threads is actually doing something, we're going to use the keyword as a variable. Here, delete these files. Save our snake make and run it again. And now you can see that because snake make has been capped at one core because we didn't specify anything else, that threads, even though we have written that it is five here, has been downscaled to one. If the snake make will downscale threads depending on the number of cores that you provide the workflow, but it will not upscale it. As an example, if we were to set this to two, and delete these. And we were to run SnakeMake with five cores. You can see that SnakeMake has not upscaled our threads value. It will only downscale them to make sure that it matches the system that you're working with. The best way to use threads tends to be to use it as a keyword, often as an argument within uh, some sort of command. Often it's T or dash dash threads or something like that, and then you would just specify it this way. But threads can also be used to have snake make parallelize the jobs that it's running, and we will be seeing that a little bit later once we introduce wildcards. So let's discuss wildcards in a little bit of detail. To really illustrate this point, we're going to make a completely different snake make workflow, and it'll probably make sense once we've created some files and shown how it's done. So we're going to delete all of that. We're going to delete files one and two. And let's say that our goal was to take some sort of files that have some naming convention and convert them to a different format. And so let's create those files. Let's say for i in one to three, do, touch file.i.txt done. All right, so we've created file.1, file.2, and file.3.txt. Wildcards are most useful when you have a standardized naming convention, and so that's what we've established here. And let's say our goal is to take file.1 and file.2 and the output we want it to be converted.1, converted.2. So let's make a final target for our rule all and call it converted to .txt. Of course, if we were to run this rule all as it is, it wouldn't be able to do anything because we haven't specified how to create converted to. So let's create another rule. I'm going to call it rule something. And I'm going to specify the input. And the input is going to be file dot thing dot txt and the output is going to be converted dot thing dot txt and to help us illustrate what's going on we're going to have a message that says converting input to output and we're going to have our shell command that's just echo 
inputs. I'm going to save this and I'm going to clear my terminal and run snakemake just by itself. What you're going to see is that SnakeMake is going to error, and we did this deliberately to illustrate another good feature of SnakeMake in that after it's completed all of the rules, if for some reason the files that it's looking for do not exist, it will wait a few seconds for them in case there's a latency thing and error out if those files still don't seem to exist even though they should. And this makes sense, right? Because we said that our target is converted.2 and so we have this output here that should be creating it, but the command doesn't actually create it. It just spits out a name, which it did here. But let's also discuss what this thing is. And I called it thing because you can use any name that you want. And I like to use silly uninformative names for teaching purposes uh, to give you this idea that there isn't a specific naming convention. So what's happening is that we have specified this output, right, converted.2.txt. And we have in this rule something, we have a very similar looking name for an output, whereas this thing is between converted and txt. So what happens is snakemake looks at this final target and looks through all of the rules in the snake file, and it sees whether any of the rules can create its intended output from the outputs of other rules. So it's really just input-output pattern matching. And so what it's doing here is that converted can take on this form converted.2. It's almost as if you're doing converted.asterisk.txt. And the input is file.asterisk.txt. And so it just so happens that in our folder we have file.1, file.2, file.3. And so it fits the pattern that is required for this to work. So if we wanted to actually have this do something, let's say we were to do copy input to output. Save that. And if we were to run snake make, we should see that it in fact created converted to. And you would think to yourself, well, if we have files one, two, and three in our folder, why did snake make only convert one of them. And the reason is that in our rule all we specify this very specific target converted.2.txt and so snakemake only grabbed this 2 to assume the value of thing here. And so if we wanted to have it do all three we could do something like this converted.1.txt comma comma converted.3.txt now, if we were to run this again, after saving it, you will see that converted 1, 2, and 3 were created, and that it did not create converted 2 because it already exists. And if you're looking at the logs, because of our message, for each job within a rule, input will assume the value of file and then whatever thing is at the time. So here, it's converting file.1 to converted.1, converting file3 to converted.3. And because 2 already exists, it skipped over it. But it would be a lot easier if there was a way to automate creating a whole series of things. And so snakemake allows us to use the expand command to achieve that end. And we can use the expand command just like this converted dot and then here we include a brand new wildcard that we will define within the command i'm naming mine avalanche dot txt comma and then you say what it is avalanche equals one two three and that is the equivalent of hard coding these exact words so if i was to save this and run snake make you will see that it performs just like it did before, and we don't have to write out every single target that we want. Following standard naming conventions, we can just iterate and create a list for us. If we wanted to do several file formats, we could create a second wildcard here, 
let's call this one pigeon. And as another argument, we just define what pigeon is. So here, pigeon will be PDF, TXT, and let's choose another one, SVG. And so here, expand will actually create nine different strings for the targets that we want. And you will have a PDF, a text, and an SVG for each of one, two, and three. And once again, I would like to reinforce that you don't actually need to have sensible names for the wildcards, although it's super helpful if you did, but you can also have multiple of these wildcards. And once again, the wildcards are only relevant within the scope of that rule itself. So avalanche is not shared across rule something, or neither is pigeon. Now what we can do is combine these expand commands and these wildcards and have Snakemake parallelize jobs for us. So to get started, what we'll want to do is, for tutorial's sake, let's have this avalanche create seven fi files. And we can delete files one through three. And instead, we're going to create a rule that generates those files for us. So let's call it rule create. There's not going to be an input, just an output. And I want the output to be file dot whatever dot txt with quotes around it, of course. Let's give it a message. Creating file output. And we're going to give it the shell command, touch, output. Now, what's going to happen is that this rule all specifies that we want converted.123456.txt. In order to create those, we have to do rule something, which requires file.123456.7, but we don't have those files in our directory. So it looks to rule create which outputs file.123456.7, and that is the order in which things will happen. So I'm going to save this. I'm going to actually add threads to this to make this a little bit faster. So let's say that we here want to add threads, and we'll say 1. And here we're also going to say threads equals 1. If we run snakemake and we specify that we want to cap it at five threads, because we've specified here that it only requires one thread to perform this job, snakemake can run multiples of these jobs concurrently up to the maximum number of cores that we provide. So if I say snakemake dash dash cores and let's say five, I need to save this. It is going to go through all of its rules and it's going to by itself parallelize the jobs for me. And not that these were terribly difficult jobs to do, but it did them faster because it was doing multiples of them concurrently. And we can see that there's all of this text creating file 5, 7, 2, whatever, and you notice that they're not necessarily in the order in which we have them listed because Snakebake's internal scheduler just has a first come first serve sort of basis to it. And once it's created the files, it moves on to converting the files. And we again see that this thing or whatever, whatever it is that we used as our wildcard for within a rule, that that remains consistent in fluctuating between one through seven. And of course, if we were to look in our explorer, we can see that we have converted one through seven. We have files one through seven, just like we specified. To get a better idea of exactly what our workflow looks like, we can use some of the built-in commands of snakemake to generate visuals of this. To do that, we'll do snakemake dash dash rule graph. We're going to pipe that into the pi dot and specify capital T underscore PNG, and that's the file format that we want, and redirect that into rule graph dot PNG. And when we open it, we can see a flowchart of exactly what our workflow is doing. Within each of these boxes is the name of our rules, and let's put that side by side so you can see it better, right? All create and something. And given the input output matching, we see that we have to go from create into something to finish off at all. 
If we wanted to see a more detailed version of what's happening, then we can request snakemake to make us a directed acyclic graph. And the command looks very similar, except we change rule graph to just DAG. And here I will change the output to rule DAG. And it will generate this much more detailed graph of what's going on. And here you can see the value that whatever takes and the value that thing takes, and those are the wildcards that we've specified in our rules. And the borders of the boxes indicate whether the job is completed or has yet to be completed. So as an example, if we were to d arbitrarily delete some of these, and we were to run the DAG one more time, you can now see that some of these have a solid border, and that implies that they have yet to be completed. And that all is not complete because some of these dependencies have not yet been met. And so it's really useful to sometimes visualize what you're doing, but of course these DAGs tend to get a little cluttered when you have thousands or hundreds of things per rule being created. And so rule graphs tend to be really useful for just summaries. In the next video, we're going to be discussing the params keyword. We're also going to introduce scripts and integrating R into our SnakeMake workflow.